Hello, greetings, programmers. Welcome to another episode of Tea, Coffee, and Code. Uh, I, I will start with Ian, who is this way from me, but I'm not sure how he's going to be oriented for everybody else. Ian, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself really quick. Hello, everybody. I'm an Embarcadero MVP for Delphi, and specifically not C++, but uh, um, you'll see me on all sorts of webinars and things like that. I get up every day and write code in Delphi and uh, write about it and um, and stream on things like this. So I'm sure you'll come across me sooner or later. That, just... that, isn't that living the dream is getting up to every day to write code, right? <laughs> In fact, all I ever wanted to do is write code. I, I do the job I wanted to do when I was 14 years old and I get paid for it. I, I, why would I not be happy? I can't think of a reason why, why I should. <laughs> exactly. All right, Mark, can you introduce yourself really quick? Yeah, Mark Moyman, Steamer Software. Uh, based in um, a town called Girona, north of Barcelona. We are the company who um, make uh, author T-chart uh, and um, develop it, support it. And uh, we're here really to help with any questions relating to that. And that's why I'm here today, I think, in partly. Fantastic. Yeah, Stima, you guys have like some of the best uh, data visualization stuff all the time. It's always... Uh... All the great, you do a lot of great stuff there. So great to have you here. Okay. And of course, the amazing David, uh, and David I, that is uh, joining us here. And I see you have your Pascal poster in the background. I was just looking at that yesterday online. Back there. Yeah. It yeah, is a, a blow up framed copy of the original Turbo Pascal One Byte Magazine ad. So Turbo Pascal 49.95. And then it had this, uh, comparison of GRT Pascal and I think it was maybe Microsoft Pascal or digital research I forget which one without turning it around yeah it was Microsoft and it was the I think it was the eight Queens benchmark probably um, but you still can use the same code uh, maybe one change in a user statement in Delphi so from from 1982 was that uh, was that ad so and or 1983 I guess it was. Um, so David, and I have been a computer programmer, software engineer, wrote my first Fortran program on an IBM mainframe in the fall of 1969. So that's about 52 years ago, if I do my math correctly. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's probably right. Uh, I just turned 70 years old. I still program every day in both C++ and Delphi just to keep my brain sharp and my skills up as much as humanly possible at this point in time. I, I live in Ashland, Oregon. It's about 14 miles. I, I, was I was born and raised in California, always lived within three miles of the Pacific Ocean. But uh, a couple of years ago, I, my wife and I moved up here to Southern Oregon, but I'm only 14 miles from the California-Oregon border down Interstate 5. So if I feel nervous or worried or look homesick about <laughs> California, I, I, over the Siskiyou summit, go another mile and cross the border. What's a uh, fun fact is right at the border on the California side, there is a liquor store in a town called Hilt, H-I-L-T, right off the highway. It's parking lot is always packed with people coming north into Oregon because Oregon is a uh, state run liquor stores or state licensed liquor stores with big taxes. So a lot of people drive and stop and get up there. If you drink like hard liquor, uh, they load up their trunk with boxes of hard liquor for them and their friends, and then they continue on into Oregon. So if you ever want a business in Northern California near the Oregon border, separate from maybe that green stuff that grows, uh, you can go to a liquor store near the border. Anyway, love being here, love uh, to do everything. I've been doing a lot more C++ builder these days just because there's a lot of great Delphi people creating lots of great Delphi content. And so I want to make sure that C++ builder gets its time in the sun as well. Sure. All right. Borland code uh, gear in prize for 36 years. So many people putting questions saying, Oh, it's David I. So cool. Hey, David I. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. we should cheer you on, David. <laughs> but I miss all the people out there, but I don't miss flying all over the world. Sorry. Just don't. <laughs> Only to Hawaii. 
comment real quick. We have some upcoming Key Coffee and Code sessions. So you're already signed up for these. July 23rd or June 23rd is real time streaming and message queues. The 30th is working with the Apple M1 processor. We're going to look at what you can do today with 1042 as far as running Windows on Apple M1 and things along those lines. July 7th is Docker containers and platforms, which is the whole idea of platform as a service, if you will, where you can. Um, spin up an instance of an operating system or uh i guess not platform spin up an instance of like a database so you don't have to have all these databases installed but instead you just uh hydrate a docker container whatever the term is for it to give you access to that database and then it can go away immediately and then also great for deployment and such and then on the 14th we have blockchains and nft which is non-fungible tokens, which should be an interesting conversation. There's a lot of big news going on around this uh, related to cryptocurrency, but the focus is not really going to be on cryptocurrency. The warranty disclaimer, I'm not going to read this, but basically we're having a casual conversation here. So don't uh, don't take any of this as uh, official professional advice. If you, you do, if something does come up that you're like, oh my goodness, I need some more information, do some research or possibly engage with somebody else, maybe one of the other pre presenters on here in a professional capacity. Right. That's one thing I do like about this tea, coffee and code format is I get a chance to hear from, uh, we have a variety of guests, MVPs, tech partners and such on here. And then also hear from uh, the, a lot of developers asking questions and stuff. Cause this is a question and answer format. So we, Mark and David, have a few things specifically they do want to present and share but we have a lot of time to answer your questions so do put questions in the question panel and we will be typing answers there and discussing things in more detail as well so this is very much as much as we possible love to have it driven by things that are interesting to you a few ideas of some of the topics we're going to talk about uh feel free to ask questions around this or whatever else might be of interest to you in this area okay and then i th think this is yours david yeah so let's go ahead i'm going to let david run through some things here even in the early years of my career we created dashboards and simple charts and you know things of that kind but it for me it really got more exciting i think it was in 2005 2006 uh, hans rosling who was teaching uh university started thinking about and building tools for visualizing data in lots of different ways. He did a TED Talk, I think it was in 2006, just search Hans Rosling TED Talk, very famous, a lot of people watched it, have watched it since then. Then he did a BBC documentary called The Joy of Stats, where he's like in these transparent see-through glass or high, you know, thick plastic, and he's displaying data and he's talking about uh, data visualizations he was trying to show relationships between data because if you just look at like life expectancy for example in the world by country or inside of your country then it's like okay that tells you something that you know live till 40 or 60 or 70 and how it's changed over time then he started gathering data about things like education level or economic level in a country and how it relates to life expectancy or health, you know, how many people got sick or died. Or for example, looking at deaths or population over time, you can see impacts of things like World War I, World War II in Europe and, you know, in countries in Russia where there were so many deaths, Japan, and so on. You could see the dip as you animate over time. And there's a, a, a Gapminder is an online site that he and his family and, and team created. And you can go to just search Gapminder. I've got links in a, in a blog post I put up this, this morning on the Embarcadero site. All these links are there as well. And, uh, and then there's a, an offline edition where you can uh, put data sets in and there's also you know a wealth of data sets out there and you can do these kinds of comparison analysis type type applications um, 
he, they did license some of their technology to Google, and that's where the Google Public Data Explorer uh, has a similar look and feel to this Gapminder. But that really got me even more excited to look into more information and data, uh, data analysis. Of course, the whole rise of data science and R and Python and people using to to not only analyze and look at data, but look for the stories behind the data and then do visualizations that tell the story. The old picture or graph or dashboard tells a lot about uh, what's behind all of this. And then there's different interesting ways. If you go to the next slide, there's lots of different tools and ways to visualize data. There's lots of different sites. This was something when we had that uh, trial run teak code and coffee or tea coffee and code uh you know a month or so ago uh, my blog post has a lot more there are lots of websites like information is beautiful for example that give you ideas about different visualizations uh, tableau is an online site there's a free version and then you can pay for creating visualizations they have like the visualization of the day that link is there again you can go to my embarkator blog and click on all the different links lots of different ways to use delphi and c++ builder to do visualization libraries components samples and so on galore um, of course you could just use the base vcl or you can use direct 2d or if you want to do cross platform you can use you know fire monkey uh, T-chart, I think standard edition is included in Delphi C++, but I'll leave that to Mark to say, to talk more about, and there's pro editions and so on, and, and T-charts available in .NET and a whole bunch of other uh, language support. So I'll leave that there. There's Gigasoft has a set of components. Uh, when we bundled FastReport, one of the things that is this FastCube sort of data cube. There was a data cube before uh, that, uh, that came with the database stuff, but the FastCube really gave you lots of uh, cool ways to move around inside of the data and spin things around and look at uh, different aspects of your data. Again, you can go right to whatever platform you're gonna run your application on and draw. And then um, there's been several webinars. There was a two-part webinar using a Python for data by the PyScriptor you have a Delphi or C++ builder app that then uses the light. There's all these cool visualization and data uh, libraries that are available for Python because the growth of Python is use of data science. So there were two Delphi ones, and then I did a C++ builder version as well. And so there you would use the power of Python and all its visualization libraries to uh, to do those parts and integrate that into your Delphi and C++ builder applications using the Python for Delphi component wrappers of the Python runtime. And that was pretty cool. And I've got the links in my blog to the replays. Jim has some blog posts of the replays and pointers to sample code and Python for Delphi for those three, part one, part two Delphi, and then the C++ version. Again, a bunch of links. There's lots of different, you know, Google Data Explorer, but Oracle, Microsoft, uh, Click. There's a bunch of different Oracle. They all have these analytics engines and visualization uh, parts of services that they provide. So if you you don't want to write it all yourself in Delphi or C++ Builder, some of those have uh, APIs, developer interfaces that you can do with the software as a service part to get some things done for you. And I have a list again in the blog post of a lot more. If you don't have data or the way I think about it is everybody's got data, but if you want to relate that data to other things that are happening in the world, you know, if you're trying to analyze your sales data by country, you might want to relate your sales data to the economic data that the World Bank for example, has been collecting for years and years and years. Um, or if you're doing work in the US, or maybe there's, I, I didn't look for other data sites in other countries that do census. I did for, for, for Brazil at one point in time for the states, but you can relate. Well, yeah, hopefully you would hope there would be a, a relationship between where your products are sold 
to things like the education level or how many you know engineers and you know software engineers and programmers and computer scientists universities are putting out where those people are living around the world and starting their companies or joining companies uh, if you want to have that data there's a lot of public data out there that again you can figure out gee how come we're not selling more in cologne in germany or how much how come we're not getting more business in iceland well okay i used to say jim where we would travel were the places where software was being purchased and used you know we wouldn't go to the middle of nowhere something we would go to you know like you went to tokyo and we go to the big cities big countries big economic base but it turns out you can also find little pockets of engineering that that uh, pop up for for a variety of reasons and where you might be able to do some some software sales or some in the case of the market developer tool sales like there's this valley in eastern idaho where a bunch a bunch of engine software engineers migrated from utah and then but we would never go there but they would drive to salt lake to the delphi <laughs> salt lake city you know and it was i don't know it was a long pretty long drive but but it got them out of that small valley in eastern idaho and so there's people in everywhere and now of course one of the things i've always loved about software unless you have to go into a big city office, is you can build software anywhere, even pre-pandemic, right? You can build software anywhere. You just need power, computers, and your your brain, your ideas, your thoughts. Now, if you want to be able to connect to the world, you need to have internet, but I guess uh, SpaceX Starlink is making that easier, easier if you're off the grid and, and satellite geosynchronous internet is so slow because I've traveled and tried to use some of that so or there isn't uh you know a cell tower nearby but uh but you can do software anywhere and there's developers all over the place and they're probably busy on and active on github and elsewhere so you can find them and also businesses that are using shopify and other kinds of systems that may need some custom software or maybe they need a, a dashboard for their sales built on the top of T chart for okay so I, I just have a, a few demos hopefully you see my rad studio something I did a long a long time ago a sample I uh, we were speaking at you know the Embarcadero conference down in Brazil and so I I had built and then sort of resurrected to make sure they worked uh, some examples what I did was I took the population data of the states of Brazil over time and uh, and did a couple different examples, one using FireMonkey 3D and then uh, one using T-Chart. I've got a group here. There's uh, Here's a uh, Brazil charts charting. So if we look at this, this example just, uh, what it has is a, a chart down below. We've got the states and then I've got a table. This is all in an interbase database of, of uh, population census uh, in different years for the uh, state and state's abbreviations, for example. And then another example is, is a fire monkey example. Let's bring this one up, hopefully. No, that's not no, wrong, there, this one, there we go. So this, this one, I took some mapping data and I, used Inkscape to pull out the path info of the outlines of each of the states and then put that on a 3D fire monkey screen and then change the depth of, uh, of, of the population so you can see the growth in different states. So let's just run this one if it all still works. Let me try it this morning. And so it lets you step through the different census years and then see the growth in in population uh, for each of those years. So I don't know why my computer's running slow. Maybe go to webinars, choosing up things. So we'll open the states. So here's the states. So I started by getting the path info. I think it was from a world map, maybe from the CIA. I'm not sure, but I it gives you the path info. I've stored the path info, which is the origin point, uh, 
move to arc to you know and then end uh, for each of the states and so I've painted those in different colors in their outlines and so this is the population by state uh, in uh, in 1872 so we can we can change that and you'll notice how by changing the depth moving uh, the camera as well I can see that down here Sao Paulo will grow really big uh, over time of course I probably should have put the abbreviations and names of the states. This is Rio over here and so on. Some didn't have a census, so they just stay flat for a while. Some of these inland uh, probably had population, but, uh, but maybe not. And then I had some, you know, rotate it around and use this arc dialer if you wanted to look at it in a different way and then reset the camera. Come back. No, it's not going to come back. I don't know why. Hmm. Anyway. Um, and then for the, let's go down here for charting. Oh, that was this, the Delphi version. So here we just want to look at the data uh, in, a, in a bar chart. That's probably the sort of simplest way. And uh, again, so here's the, you know, the T chart thing. So we want to chart the population, for example, of, uh, of this one selected state. And we can step through the populations here was one that didn't have a census back in the early years. Um, and we're just stepping through, or if I wanted to just look at Sao Paulo, right, I, I do this kind of thing and then chart the population for Sao Paulo, which is 46 million now, for example. Um, and then I, was it this last one for the C++ folks? Uh, let's... Uh, run this one. And so this one I use, I think this uses a bar chart and then I used a timer to animate um, the population data over time. So we could start the visualization. And so here are the different populations. Notice Sao Paulo uh, goes way past uh, everything. It's Sao Paulo is big city. It's the it's the financial and economic and technology center. So we'd always run the conference, but then we'd go to Belo Horizonte, the different cities and Rio and so on. Uh, so just another way to look, and this is a nice uh, default uh, 3D bar chart from uh, T-Chart. Again, I'll let Mark do more with that. Um, okay, let's go. And I'll put all these, I'll put links, I'll zip these up, put them on GitHub and and put them, uh, put the link, I'll update the blog post after this based on questions and things. Um, Anders Olson, who worked with me uh, years ago, is now at Wide Orbit running development there, of their software uh, and applications. And he, we wanted to be able to visualize math equations. So instead of data to look at math equations, so we, he, he researched and used a mesh to do the grid lines and then the 3D surfaces. This is that viewport 2D. And we picked some formulas that really looked cool when you graph them. So, uh, you know, it's again, a different way of thinking about visualization. Of course, there could be the maps, just bubbles and area charts and things of that kind. So, so I always like these because they just look cool. You know, this sine of x squared plus z squared divided by x squared z squared, you know, it just, it just, and then he put different colors based on the, the, the y values. And then you can do this kind of thing. This, I like this, this one here, you know, where you kind of are looking from the moving the camera from the bottom looking up into the chart but you could use this same rather than math formulas this again could be some kind of data service surface for example uh, this one there is no truth in the rumor that this is how you design your shirts <laughs> no it's not we just well again anders picked the colors and so this one i updated a little bit for recent for the 10.4 just fixed a couple changes that over time because his blog post for this and webinar goes you know years back and there were a few changes here and i this sometimes sort of like the bat ray or stingray kind of one and then this one just i don't know it looks like that thing from aliens the movie or something like that but 
So again, a, a different thought about, you know, about visualizing and maybe you can map, trying to map your data to a mathematical representation or vice versa, see how it maps to a mathematical. And this was uh, an example, and this is in from the, from the webinars, this is just using a, um, you know, a Delphi app that uses the Python engine. There's the hook to the Python engine. I forget which version I'm running of Python, maybe 3.8 or 3.9 here. And you need to install using uh, the Python uh, program pip to bring in all these different uh, runtime libraries. So this one, is this the penguins one? I forget which one this is. I'm not sure. There was different. It takes a little while because it's running. Uh, the Delphi part of the app runs really fast, but then the visualization part is running in Python and it's got to go through a bunch of data and then display if it works. There it is. So this is just a, you know, a, a this kind of bubble chart of volume and percent change of data, whatever it was. And so this is coming back into the Delphi app uh, via an, an SVG. So it, it gets the SVG version of the underlying Python chart and then displays it uh, in an area there. I guess Seaborn, that's probably the penguin one. They have the visualization of all these different uh, penguin species. Is that the right term or subspecies of penguin? And uh, somebody collected all this data, probably went down to Antarctica and Falkland Islands and whatever, Argentina, Southern Argentina to get this kind of data. And again, you know, the time is really spent not in the Delphi process. You can see the, the Delphi app is pretty straightforward and there's not that much Python, but it's crunching the numbers underneath. And then you could always save the uh, visualization uh, as a bitmap and then just display it, or you could put the Python part on a service somewhere. So these are bill bill length of different, uh, you know, bill depth and what is this flipper length? Oh, that's good. And body mass of different, um, you know, the Adeli, Chinstrap, and Gentoo. I want that job. That sounds like fun, except if it's really cold. So that's that's a way of using. Uh, data visualization and then getting the bitmap of the visualization and displaying it into a, into the Delphi application uh, over here. And this one uses the uh, SVG icon image uh, component. You get you get the, the SVG uh, libraries or components from, uh, from Get It. So, and then there, again, there's a lot of online sites that I've used. Um, a, few, a few years back, may have been seven or eight, I'm not sure, um, Jim, but Ray Kanopka did a, wrote a white paper and did a webinar on data visualization and multi-device apps with FireMonkey. The link I have here goes to a registration form. I'm not sure if the white paper and the video are publicly available without giving uh, Embarcadero some information, but uh, that link will take you to the form to sign up to, and then they send you the link to the PDF file and uh, and to the video replay. So just lots of, lots of blogs to follow, uh, other kinds of tools and services that I mentioned with links to them, uh, sources of data. Uh, Kegel uh, has all these data sets for data scientists to play with and people there, they were having competitions, you know, to see who can build the best visualization based on a certain data set linked to US Census. They have this nice series called Data Gems where they highlight some of the data that they're collecting and show you visualizations. And it's a nice video where I live here. There's a, uh, you know, data profile. It says, here's the visualization you'd see, for example, so they give you some high level summary. Okay, there's 216,000 people in our county. Then, you know, a chart that talks about, uh, you know, the age groups and male, female. This is, you know, an example of a map kind of thing where 
people of, that came from elsewhere outside the U.S. where they where they settle, uh, born in in Jackson County or foreign born, uh, so you can zoom in and out that kind of thing and so on. So it's another uh, set of data through the U.S. Census data that's the 2020 data is coming out this fall, but they've been giving some uh, some hints about uh, some of the stuff that's happening uh, with pre-look at the data, but the, the whole final reports will come out then. And again, just a whole bunch of links, including a few books that I thought would, might be interesting. So that's just a little bit of what I do, Jim. Oh, is he gone? Did he go away? Maybe. Yeah, he's uh, he's dropped off at the moment. So um, I, uh, my job is to be stunt double in case this happens. Uh, <laughs> we're okay. We're good. He's probably going to come back, but I think he's having trouble with his internet. Okay. Sure Take back control. I didn't want to go through all the source code stuff, but uh, I'll make sure the all these Delphi Python, all these codes uh, are linked off the webinar replay pages that are in my blog post. Um, where you can go and grab uh, the samples. Right. Um, so I think uh, if we just leave it on your screen for a second, Mark, um, have you got you've got a presentation to show? Have you or there there what is a presentation which is a, a video that I passed over to Jim to sh and Jim said he was going to show it uh, when we spoke about this uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, there was a question. Uh, relating to each export to the web page and I thought it might be clearer to to make a small demo to show the the different options so uh, we have that here this is a VCL project with a teacher on it a couple of buttons to export and uh, a memo on which to to show the 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 output text that we'll create um, if we look at the <coughs> the code itself uh, here are the two key units uh, the THTML5 canvas which is a, a native canvas uh, which creates a, a static image and the T JavaScript canvas which creates a, a, d a dynamic JavaScript chart again on the HTML5 canvas. Uh, we look at the code itself to run it, simple enough, create an exporter um, for each format. Here in this case we run a method uh, with the file name that we wish to save to. This extra code here uh, just saves the, the chart to the um, to the memo. We'll actually change the uh, the dimensions of the chart when we export it. Um, the JavaScript export very similar. Create the uh, the instance, and then run the method to save it to the to the file name of your choice. Now here here I've added some extra code to create a third chart. Uh, this is a JavaScript chart again, but it's been enhanced with some some custom code that will run in JavaScript itself. And we're adding a couple of dependencies here to other teacher units which is an, uh, an animations unit uh, and some extras and uh, a unit that we have here JavaScript in the project which uh, helps define the animation that we're we're going to run um, so that's it we're now uh, ready to run the project here on the left we have the teacher um, on the form and firstly we'll run the export to the native canvas. This creates an HTML page uh, with a header section and a JavaScript section within it. Uh, down near here we have a draw method that we're calling to create a canvas variable against the canvas on the page which we have down here in the body section of the page itself. And you'll notice in this method um, many repeated uh, methods. These are move to, line to, line to, typical uh, rendering methods and basically that runs the whole chart as uh, to set up a fixed image uh, on the page. Uh, we move now to the alternative technique which is a, a JavaScript technique using a JavaScript library. Uh, we run this method and that again creates an HTML, f uh, an HTML page with a header and a script section in it. But notice here that we're actually running a reference to um, a T-Chart JavaScript file on the Steamer web. This is a, a minified uh, T-Chart library, um, free to use, could be copied to, to your own uh, location. And um, this again includes a draw method and here we're creating a chart on the canvas. The canvas is down here 
at the bottom of the page as before in the body section and the, here we have some instructions that are more familiar to those of you who've, who've worked with T-chart T-chart panel, title, walls, uh, the axes and then further down here the series the series being created. Um, there's a third panel here uh, this is the enhanced code I showed you uh, where we've added a couple of uh, um, dependencies to the to the code itself and down here f uh, we've added a call to our our enhanced features and um, so now let's go and take a look at the the final product this is the first export we made the uh, the plot sequence uh, creates a static image uh, very faithful to the original the second export is also faithful to the original um, but this is based now on the teach JavaScript library and is therefore uh, a live chart it can be zoomed and scrolled uh, and further enhanced as we can see if we look at the enhancements that we made which now creates a chart that's completely different we disabled the marks we enabled a, a mouse over hint uh, this could be further coded to uh, run a variety of different uh, different features um, I hope that helps to understand the difference between the different export formats. These are some of these that I've installed in Get It are, are used in some of the demos for the Python for Delphi, the image list, SynEdit for hi syntax highlighting the path Pascal code and such. And then for the T chart, I just use the standard uh, version components that come with, with, uh, Delphi and C++ builder. So, talk about some of the questions that we have. Um, so, some of the questions that we've got, um, lots and lots of them saying, "Good to see David I again." He, you really are popular, David. <laughs> yeah. Um, many comments on your um, shirts. I don't see a particularly uh, uh, exciting one, but I think most people, like myself, I mean, I've been a Delphi developer since <laughs> Delphi one. And, um, you know, for many, many years, you were the public face of everything to do with Delphi. And, uh, and I think that um, you won a lot of, um, a lot of uh, fans for the way that you present. So, you know, from a personal point of view, thanks for the things you've done, because I really appreciate it as much as everybody else does as well. So I learned so much more from everyone out there. Every, you know, I knew a little bit because I was sitting there where the engineers work in, in Scotts Valley and also visiting our offices around the world. But but I learned as much, if not more, about Delphi and how to use it and C++ Builder because uh, there's more of you doing more things than anything I could ultimately build. I can't couldn't build everything. And then the whole community that we fostered of component and tool vendors around the world and encouraged to, to extend the product uh, really uh, made the what's modern Rad Studio. I mean, now with Get It, we didn't have that before, uh, where you can just go and get trials and standard versions and, and all sorts of cool libraries. Of course, there was the Jedi group uh, and what they do with their own runtime library and components and so on. And so many with uh, Steema, with TMS, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, so I mean, many for, me, for me as a developer, it, it, since I became an MVP, it's exactly the same thing. I think, you know, I've been a programmer for nearly 40 years, 38 years, something like that. And, um, you know, we're nothing if it's not for standing on the shoulders of giants. That's absolutely a fact. And, uh, and the, the reason that, um, you know, I like being an MVP is because it encourages me to be a better programmer, but also to share some of the things I've learned over my time with other people, but to, to learn as much. You know, I mean, getting involved in these things teaches you an awful lot about um, the, the art of coding and, and all the rest of it. Um, hopefully I'm sharing my screen now. If anybody wants to um, put a chat message and say that's not the case, because um, uh, Jim, was the uh, main presenter and I've taken over, but I think we're now sharing the Q&A. Um, so uh, a couple of um, questions. Um, people are saying um, about the, let me just have a look. Um, is the code available for the examples? Um, 
that uh, you showed. I think you said that it was available. Is that right? The ones for the Delphi Python are linked off of the webinar replays and the blog post, but I'm going to take some of the other ones I've done since that time. I'll put them up on my GitHub and I'll just add to my blog post, which is the blog post. I don't know if I can put it in the chat room. Maybe I can. Uh, well, I've put the link to the chat, the uh, blog post in the chat. So um, the David, David's blog has got all the links in there you could want. I, I didn't really. Jim said, can I copy some links over? But actually, you, you covered it all. So <laughs> didn't really seem to be my I just point. haven't put some of these examples I've been playing with the last couple of weeks just to clean them up. Some of them are historic ones, you know, from way back that I updated to make sure they ran on 10.4. I haven't tried them on Community Edition, but. Uh, I may do that as well, just to make sure. But, but in any case, I'll put the links to the source code. I'll update the blog probably tomorrow because I've got some other things to do this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. weirdly, I have other things to do tomorrow. Um, okay, um, people asking about uh, what's the advantage of Python um, and using Python with Delphi. Um, I think I'll let David answer that, and I might answer a bit of that as well. well for me. And you can watch the replay of the Delphi for Python webinars where there's more use cases talked about and, ex and more examples built. Uh, and I think it was, was it last T, Coffee and Code, there was a discussion about scripting languages and, and mm -hmm. where you might use scripting languages, whether that's client-side or server-side JavaScript or, or other kinds of things. In the sense of data visualization, there are great components and libraries for Delphi and C++ Builder where you can visualize, and we'll let Mark talk more about what, again, what Steam is doing. But with the rise of data science, there was always data processing and data other things, but this area where computers getting into anthropology and you name it, every kind of field of endeavor, and having programming languages and tools and libraries besides just online, or software as a service systems for visualizations. Uh, there was a lot of effort in R and Python in that world, and Python be, being probably the, the most popular now. There's just a whole bunch of Python libraries, like mm. that did all those crunchings and visualization and then giving you the ability to save as an SVG or a PNG or whatever, and put that into a, a web page and have it be live and animated where Python's running in the background, uh, or in that this case, running on the Python engine inside of my notebook computer underneath the Delphi, going through the Python engine component to get to the Python runtime, send the script over, let it do its thing, get the data results back. And so in the data visualization area, or in just the Python scripting, I mean, I think in the webinar from the past, there was that question about why would you calculate prime numbers using Python when you can use optimized code in Delphi C++ Builder to calculate prime, num you know, prime numbers or pi to x number of places. Um, there's a speed advantage in, in compiled optimized code. But again, there's just all these other libraries you have to, I, I probably will never have time in my life to explore every Python add-in library. Um, well, the, the, the Embarcadero blogs has got, uh, if you click on the Python um, tag, there are hundreds and hundreds of libraries. And there's a lot of posts at the moment about machine learning, AI. Um, there's been some very good posts in the last couple of weeks um, to do with the Python machine learning and AI and detecting text in images and detecting logos and faces and emotions and stuff like that. And this is stuff that um, I pretty certain there are not specific Delphi libraries for it, but uh, there are very much um, Python libraries that, that are available for it. And plus it's marrying the whole concept of a scripting language with uh, with a, a compilation as well as it's, it's a benefit. I, I think that's... There are libraries, you know, Metoff software has components for neural nets and so on. There's also, if you want to connect, Al Manorino did a uh, connecting to IBM Watson to let Watson do a bunch of the work. There's a lot of other, you know, software services out there that you can pass part of your programming and data to that'll run very fast versus on this little notebook computer to do things. But again, I only mention it here in the context of 
data visualization, but there are many other people using Python, Python for a lot of things. It's just one. And this was just an easy way because the component components that are on GitHub free to download uh, for Delphi connected to Python. And because they're components, then C builder to Python as well. Yeah. And, and, and that's it. I mean, MATLAB and a few other of those libraries are very, very popular. And um, I think that's why. I mean, we, we don't have to hate every other programming language just because it's not Delphi or C. <laughs> you know, there, there are positives and negatives to any any of these things. And I think that's, um, that, that's been the proved way. by, you know. Plus, Pulse Builder could do right for high speed optimized code, uh, FireDAC to get to your data. And again, we'll leave it to Mark and the video for for the kinds of dashboards and visualizations you can do there as well and uh, or there's again services make a rest call get the json back get the image back and just stick it right in your in your application you know in the user interface so lots cool. of ways someone said these are examples assume that you have a simple data in a table what about data that requires calculations for example percentages or formulas do you need to return the data using something like a stored procedure, or can the components do the calculations if you provide the formula? It's by Nicola. Teach I'll take whatever data you can, it, it gets, so to speak. So uh, if you're running a, a, a DB chart, uh, it'll connect to a database source directly on the on the fields of the uh, of the database tables. Um, in terms of running stored procedures, uh, that wouldn't be within the domain of Teach itself. You'd have to define that as your your extra, uh, but whatever data comes into the chart, at the mo if you wish to then export it to uh, uh, to a web page as a JavaScript chart, it would take the data as a chart and send it as arrays to the web page. So the web page doesn't have any intelligence in terms of the connection between the the data on the web page and the the source itself, though you could code that if you wish to, because then you'd have the JavaScript world available to you to be able to do that also right and uh, david do you have anything to add to that in terms of visualizing data i mean uh, I, I, maybe my comments are similar to yours in that uh, usually um most visualization components have some form of uh, data link rather than a on calculate kind of event um some reporting packages, you know, like fast reports and quick reports and um, a few others obviously have, um, you know, pre-printing uh, pre calculations and post-printing calculations and, and things like that. And, and, you know, you can add those in to, um, to manipulate what's being demonstrated or displayed or printed. But um, generally speaking, the more you can do on the database server before it hits the, uh, the program, the better, really. That, you know, that's... That said, there is there are callbacks available. You could use chart events before it actually goes to plot the data to modify in, in if you wish to. So you could you do get a last chance to get to the data if you want to. Yeah. Right. So so I think the answer is best best approach is to try and do it before you, yeah. your graph does the graphing. But if you really really have to, then you can do the callback. But of course, at that point, you're executing code every time something's being rendered or or yeah. displayed or printed. Now, uh, you know this is the same for reports in general. I think the, the smaller amount of code you can execute at the time of rendering, the more likely you are to get responsive application. And let the DBMS do all the multi-threading and all the calculations ahead of time. You know that's what. Uh, a database uh, server is there for really so uh, the best practices are do what you can before you get to get to the rendering side of things well for me it also depends on the type of application what the use case is in the sense that that for example if you're doing a building a real-time dashboard that's that's taking data from security devices or cameras or or data feeds of some kind there's always you know event eventing type systems where you can get these kind of notifications and data streams. But if you're doing, you know, real time data acquisition, I think we talked about that in the past and others have, I think last week, was it last week? I've lost track on um, the IOT uh, uh, coffee and code, you know, you're getting real time data streams and you're trying to analyze some of that data 
and present it in real time, you still probably are storing it. You're going to go back and maybe do a recap or, you know, if a machine failure happens in some manufacturing plant, you want to know immediately and you want to see what is leading up. You know, if some RPM is spinning of some machine, you know, over some threshold, you'd like to get that big red, you know, uh, flashing thing and a big klaxon that's giving you audio. But then you want to go back and look at what's going on. Or if you've got a very smart system with machine learning, you may see that that's going to happen and you see either start throttling it back or or shut it down and switch over to some other manufacturing device or heating element or whatever. So it uh, it really depends on the kind of applications. If you have, if you're doing end of quarter sales analysis, yeah, that data you could be crunching and massaging, you know, all along the month or quarter or annual, and then you're just waiting for the last bits to finish out the day, the month, the quarter, the year, for example, where you where you would do it. Um, but there's no answer to anything ever a lot of the times. It's more, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, what will you use to accomplish that? And so for me, I had an example. I was using a T-chart to, to analyze data. And then I, I did a blog post. It's on the Barcado blog, I believe. There's also David I on tools where dot com that I put some stuff on occasionally. But it was uh, I was trying to build an application using live bindings and everything else where I could build a an application that was customer and their orders and what they were ordering and a uh, a grid that uh, gave me a visualization of that and a T chart with no code. I well, use, use it, visual live bindings and I think the only thing I had to do to update the chart as I was moving through the different customers, um, I had to do a, I think it's, I forget the method, but it's like refresh data set or check data set. Uh, I had to put that in uh, uh, in a uh, in an event handler the other way is there's an auto ref T-chart has a refresh timer uh, property, I believe, where you can periodically refresh the chart. You can set up time for that, you know, like refresh it every minute or every hour or whatever. Um, but well, it, it, it's funny you you say about uh, T-chart and the um, live bindings because look what I had ready <laughs> already. <laughs> And that is, um, and, and this will make Mark happy because he loves me showing this uh, particular demo. Mm. This is um, this is a Steamer's um, dashboard component. Um, there is a blog article about it. I know because I wrote it on blogs.embarkadero.com. Look for visualizations and dashboards. And uh, th these are T charts. This is T chart Pro, and um, you can s probably see if you've got just the right resolution monitor. There's some crosshairs moving around there, which I really like. Someone asked me recently whether this could be done in um, T-chart, whether you could actually have, um, if you can see those gray values there, as I move the mouse around, you can actually see those those gray values um, change. A lot of this is done through live bindings, and I'll let Mark maybe talk about this in a moment. Um, but it's also interactive. So for example, if I, um, oh, I think uh, yeah. If I click on the um, Canada, for example, um, the chart here um, has got a, a, an event that changes all this information in in the uh, um, the linked charts here. Um, likewise, I think if I choose uh, Brazil, um, you can see everything changing. This, I think, I have to say, I mean, obviously, I know Mark and uh, um, through really through the MVP stuff and, and stuff like that. But this is a fantastic demo. If you want to show someone what can be done with, first of all, Delphi, data um, uh, database uh, handling and live bindings, this is the demo to show them. It's a FireMonkey app. Um, Mark, is this cross-platform? I don't think it is, is it? Um, no, although we no. did, we also liked it so much we copied it to Net. Uh, if I'm allowed <laughs> to mention that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, I have no, I've heard of that stuff, but I'm not really <laughs> a big fan of it. I prefer Delphi. Yeah, but uh, so, so it's fine, Monkey. I mean, um, 
uh, Jim is messaging me saying his internet is still blowing up. So there you go. Um, but I think this kind of um, visualization, um, when I was asked to start doing some posts on, on blogs.embarcadero.com, and you really should go there because there's a lot of good stuff coming out there now. Um, this was the first one that came up. It just happened to be fitting in with the, the idea of what we were doing. And um, I really like this. And I can actually um, also um, pull over my uh, IDE. And um, behind the scenes, we've got the code. There is not a lot of um, code really going on behind there um, to make things happen. I think this is part of the export to your code, Mark. I'm sure you can explain it more thoroughly than than I, I can. But, but I um, doing that. oh, you don't? Oh, well, then, yeah. <laughs> not mine. I know that much. I downloaded it from your site. So, yeah. but it, it's okay. one of the samples. But it, if you if you go to the Steamer site. Um, and download their examples. It is one of the examples on there. I think the exact sample is under T chart Fire Monkey Samples dashboard. Um, and it is by that very nature uh, cross platform in that respect. Um, it, it's multi platform. And if you could also run the same on VCL if you if you wish to, you could uh, get the same demo up and running. Yeah, and, and there's a whole bunch of um, live bindings going on and stuff like that in the background. And I, you know, it, this is really showing the concept of low code. I mean, I know that's a fashionable trend now, but, you know, Delphi has always been not that there's low code behind the scenes because there's a whole bunch of code, you know, in all these steamer units that, that make the T-chart happen. But from our point of view as developers, I'm a lazy developer. I want, I want to get paid for my work, but I really don't want to do too much. Uh, uh, you know, I've always said this is the thing about Delphi and C++ is that, you know, these kind of component-based developments and this this kind of um, almost drag and drop design of things is, is is the secret to being productive. And I am very productive. I'm much more produ productive than some of my peers working in other languages and, and repeatedly like that. It's not just a fluke. I haven't accidentally been good on one project. It's not about being good. It's about using the right tools, and which is Delphi. And so here, you know, you can you can see that there's just a bunch of components on there. Behind the scenes, if we drill down into the units that have got all the T-chart in, once you have the source, then there's a thousands and thousands of lines of code going on behind the scenes. But actually, to make, make those charts work, it's really not a lot of effort. And yet, look at how cool that dashboard is. You know, it's doing an awful lot with drill downs and, um, you know, crosshairs and all the rest of it. It's a remarkable thing to... Um, behold, really, to show how um, how easy it is to uh, to um, make a fairly impressive um, visualization work. And he's even got the export to web button, which I think I may have broken when I was playing around with it the other day. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, there you go. Um, so we address some more of the questions. Is the sample app using the T chart component? I think um, David's was. Um, this particular app that I'm showing is used, and the one that um, Mark was showing is using T-Chart Pro. So the answer is yes, although um, some of the examples use the Pro um, version of the component, which does a little bit more. And, um, what is the difference between the Pro and the standard? Um, the, main, the, the main differences are the number of series types. Um, so the standard version has uh, line, line bar, uh, bar, pi, or these kind of uh, main series types, and the pro version has many extended types, including the the maps that you've got here. And uh, the other thing is functions and tools. So function types, statistical function types, there are many more in the pro version, and tools such as that crosshair. Um, would be, for example, one of the type of tool that there might be more in the in the pro version than the standard version. Right. Yeah. And, you know, paperwork. Yeah. Oh, and the export format. Sorry, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Give me back desktop control for a moment. I'll, I'll just bring up that one bar chart example I did. Going back to you then. Is that used? That uses just the uh, the built-in version that comes with um, with Delphi and C++ Builder. So, you know, I've got a a chart again. Here's the chart and and the code, nothing special, right? I just have a census year um, array of years up here, and then I just set a timer, and then I go through the census year, 
querying the database for it and then I just call there was that method called check data source will do the refresh update of the chart um, if you go into you right mouse click on T chart you know I've got a, a I'm using a DB version of the T chart just going through interbase Express components up here so you can edit the chart and if you add a series that's where you can choose this is what's in the standard edition these chart types point pie fast line horizontal line horizontal shape and arrow bubble and so on but there's there's other chart types and more things that you can do as well um, and there's all sorts of you know settings here for the the axis and title of the chart and so on we look at the series all i did was set the uh data in the data source tab i set the data set for ib query i ended up writing code because i wanted to animate it but i wanted the state appreciation you know i used the fields editor to create get the fields from the query and i took the state abbreviation for my label so i could see which state each of the bars uh, did versus population and so on so you can do all of this just right mouse click and again it says I'm using T chart standard and whatever the version is and uh, and so on and there's other kinds of options to export the chart and such and also you know use live bindings so you can you can do it all by setting the property of the chart and doing live bindings and so on or you can write some code again this was not very much that code was just getting the next uh, census and doing the query the query here was nothing big it's just like star from brazil population that's table where census year parameterized citrus here ordered by state abbreviation that way the things stay in the same you know place on the chart and then otherwise t chart did all the uh, work for me i didn't have to do much i think i i there's an option here for auto colors i, said, I just chose color each versus trying you can also go into code and create color for the different bar charts, but, but T chart did such a great job that and again, there's others, you know, there's other component libraries that have charting functions to explore TMS and 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 fast reports, others that do something. Color each was the one that chose the colors that looked great for me. So I didn't have to worry about it. And then you have you got lots of different control options. These are just property settings, but you could as always with components, you can do it code behind your application as well so and it just did a you know like I showed before it did a great job that was only maybe five lines of code six lines of code something like that and the power of and this for the C++ folks so you know yeah and uh, I know this is the the advantage of C++ and Delphi that it's you know a lot of the work is hard work is done for you and you you you've can't always get away with writing no code. That's why it's called low code. The idea is that you're you're trying to write the minimal amount to actually tell it to do something um, at a high level, rather than saying render this on this canvas, do this, draw this, shade this, do this rectangle. Um, you know, I mean, I can't preach it to the converted. I'm sure because a lot of people that are here are probably uh, well aware of why they would uh, want to use Delphi and uh, C++, but uh, or Red Studio in general, but it, just in case you are watching and you're not a convert, we're trying to show you uh, exactly what the benefits are. And it, it, it's it's um, it's good not to have to type thousands of lines of code to do something straightforward like showing a graph. Yeah, and you could choose to scale or again, T-chart, most of them will do auto scaling for you. So I didn't have to write any code to change the, you know, the Y axis up here. It just looked at what's the, largest one and then it scales everything you'll see it changing over time so if you look at the, these since i chose the label of the states but over here as uh as just you know as the populations are growing some of the states you can see the y-axis changing and scaling so again i didn't have to do anything special there unless i wanted to but you know i'm a little older now so maybe <laughs> <laughs> That's a we're, all, we're all a little bit older now. <laughs> but it's always the case. I mean, let the components do what what they're supposed to do, but then they expose the interfaces so that you can, right? So that you can. Uh, you can take it onto where you want to. Really, it's uh, 
um, very extendable. Extend the component to do something special and so on. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's interesting as well that um, uh, there's an article I'm about to um, um, put up on the uh, the blog that's about how things have evolved over the years. Most of us at some point, if we're writing applications, have written a routine that does find first, find next on, on a bunch of files in a, a folder. So you're looking for, I don't know, some images or something like that. So you've written an application and it's, it's pulling together a bunch of files. The old way of doing it used a lot of API calls and you couldn't really do it. First of all, you had to have a callback, um, but you could, which is not really an accessible thing for a beginner to understand how a callback might work. But secondly, there were lots of iterations and, and um, re-entrant code that would pass the folder over so that it would then iterate again and look for files. Now, with the, um, the, the more recent changes in the runtime library, it's one line of code. You know, it's a, a T directory dot get files and off you go. The, 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 it returns a list of all the file names and folders and it will do all the subdirectories as well. And that's the thing that it's Delphi is not a static language and neither is C++. And the runtime library that's behind it is also evolving. And, and certainly in my years of using uh, the languages, things have really come on in leaps and bounds. So it was already quite succinct before. It's becoming even more terse and succinct as things um, go on. And, and, you know, component developers learn how to, um, you know, add features that, that help us out. I mean, yeah. IO utils unit. It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's a great boon. Yeah, I turned it off, but you know, you can use the mouse wheel for zoom, and and you have events for you know, on zoom, undo the zoom. So there's all the things you would see in another system. While I've got control here, I think uh, this is this Gapminder tools offline, but you can also do it through the Gapminder website, and so it's got. Uh, some different types of visualizations chart. This one is my favorite one. But again, T-chart has bubbles. You can call the add bubble uh, method and add data for different bubbles. So this, I think this default, this is an example of that comparison world, right? So this is one of the default data sets that I chose. It's, it's income to life expectancy, right? Going back to, what is that, 1800 to something, 2020. So, you know, you can start, sometimes you'll see drop downs. There was either some pandemic of some kind uh, or, you know, who knows, change in whatever. You see some drops uh, where things drop down. Some were going to come up here in the year uh, 19, what was it 18, the Spanish flu, so called Spanish flu. Uh, you'll see drops. You'll see drops for World War One. There was that World War One. And then, uh, and there was the depression drop, and then you have drops in the World War II time. And of course, you really want up and to the right, right? You want everybody making more, you know, the total population having less poverty and more uh, more income per capita, and you want to live longer. So you'll you'll see, okay, U.S., but there's other other countries out here, you know, oil, so right, Sultan of Brunei, lots of oil revenue. Uh, again, all these are Saudi Arabia and so on. You still got China back here, uh, but you'll you'll see them, those countries going up in life expectancy, and they have large populations, so the income per capita. But now look at China moving forward, and then they had the size based on population, so you can choose lots of different things, the size based on population. So the, you might check this out. This is the offline version where you can download, and then you've got lots of data that you can compare, and, and including putting your own data in as well uh, to compare maybe from some of these data sets, as I mentioned in the slide conversation, uh, to get I think you. I find it entirely depressing if I had a graph of my own data. <laughs> <laughs> Life expectancy and income. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that would, if it goes downwards, I'd be very upset, I think, yeah. <laughs> This is related. Yeah, it's you, you know, as we said in, in a previous webinar um, and a blog as well, the point about data visualization is the art of taking something useful and making it beautiful but useful. So, you know, it's if you have a whole string of numbers in a table, 
you know, we've all looked at spreadsheets with vast columns of numbers and and tables and stuff like that of data in in a in a query result that's returned. Um, you know, visualization, which is really what we're talking about here, is about making that that data more readily consumable by um, users. And uh, and um, y you know, it's got to um, it, it's got to be useful to try and abstract that down into what you just showed there, which is that you know you can tweak a whole bunch of different parameters visualize it in a way where you can immediately say oh what happened in 1834 because there was this big drop but if you were looking at that column those columns of data i think much much more difficult to spot the spikes and of course this is why governments and businesses you know and marketing managers that will will use charts because it makes it much easier to uh, um you know consume that data into something a little bit more readily understandable. Yeah, I want to write my programs to do some things, but I use these visualization sites to get ideas for maybe visualizing some of the data that uh, that I'm interested in. So I but I could use Tableau or there's a whole bunch of other, you know, again there's there's any number of sites um, as I have in my blog post. That I've used Tableau as well, and it's a remarkable resource. It's very, very useful. There's another one that I was using recently, this data wrapper uh, out of Germany. And again, it's got a free price level, and it's got a, uh, you know, it's it's got paid versions and commercial versions and so on. But it has lots of, again, a choice of maps and charts. And mix and match these things and they have lots of customers of course you see these days you see in the last several years all the New York Times and everybody else it's just easier sometimes to explain the pages of story that's going to be involved to visualize the data as part of the explanation right in the uh, my my favorite uh, my favorite visualization that I use a lot is um, I get people from the UK, they, they think the UK, you know, England, Scotland, the Ireland and Wales, they think it's a large country because, you know, that's what they know, you know, and, they, and that is their entire world and their entire kind of social um, interactions tend to be within that, that area and then they go well, on holiday somewhere. And so they will use that kind of, um, that inner knowledge that they have of distances uh, and try and apply it to a country like the United States, which of course is absolutely enormous. And the one um, map that I have superimposes the United Kingdom and Europe on top of the United States. And, it, and it's an absolutely tiny little speck. <laughs> uh, so when people say, oh, how far away are you from the sea? And I say, 12 hours from the sea. And they say, possibly be 12 hours from the sea and I say not only am I 12 hours from the sea but I don't leave the state of Texas in that time either <laughs> it's a long long distance you know it's a, it's a and that's again that's trying to take something that is difficult to actually get your head around to get this concept of a thousand miles but if you see it as a picture with your country that is your your social arena and have it superimposed on this massive much much bigger country of the united states it, it becomes a lot more um, readily understandable for people to go oh oh yeah i see what you mean now it really it really is a big country yes yes it is and canada is even bigger you know Alaska. Atlanta, russia i think there was this saturday night live thing what fits in russia you know they were taking countries and <laughs> like a big pot they put everything in it and china <laughs> and and alaska as well alaska is remarkable Eleven time zones of Russia, then they collapsed it to nine. <laughs> <laughs> they reduced it down to nine. Well, what can you say? Always yeah. a... I mean, the, the older I get, the more I travel, the more I realize quite how tiny the, the amount of knowledge I have about the world is, even though I've been to something like 26 different countries. It's a remarkable place, you know, the world, and, and uh, absolutely enormous. You know, and you only learn that by accident. I think it doesn't really sink in until you you have to travel anywhere for a very long time. 
Alexander um, about you know 3D feature using GL scene, and he has the link. I'm gonna send put in the Q and A. Uh, he's got a source forge uh, link for GL scene. There's I mean some people use OpenGL. There's a bunch of of different uh, you know libraries and so on that uh, that you can use. Absolute with any number of visualizations, including uh, in native code. Yep. Yeah. Um, someone was saying Texas is the only state that has four digits in their road numbers. We also have a type of road here called a farm to market road, which is can be several hundred miles long. It's a long way to the market. <laughs> very, uh, very strange situation. Um, so we've got some uh, a couple of other questions then. Um, someone asking about, oh, they said they started out writing interrupt handlers and low level Novell IPX network commons with inline assembler in TSRs written in Turbo Pascal. Oh, yes, I can understand that. I've written um, machine language and, and had it in uh, Visual Basic. Well, it wasn't Visual Basic, but basic um, comments. You used to poke it in the, the comments on, on uh, I think, Sinclair's and stuff like that. That's kind of off the topic. And then you say, now I can get rich structured data with no code through live bindings. Delphi and we programmers have come a long way for sure. I, I absolutely, unfortunately, he's gone. It's Scott Lewis, but I totally agree. You know, the, the great thing about uh, the, being in the industry that we're in is that it's always changing. Nothing's the same ever. You know, if you were to suddenly get zapped up into the clouds and come back in five years' time and get dropped into into the world, I think it would be quite remarkable. You know self-driving cars and i have a nissan it's not a very exciting car but my car is able to tell me if there is someone behind me when i'm reversing but not only that it'll actually tell me that i'm just about to turn into the path of another vehicle or if i go too fast and i don't slow down enough it'll actually apply the brakes and keep me inside the lanes and all the rest of it and it's just a straightforward regular car it's it's absolutely incredible and these these kind of um leap forward in technology is very very regular and i i like the fact that you know we are trying to keep up with it with red studio as well and uh, and you know program lots of devices you know and use technologies like beacons and things like that it's, it's a long way you have to pick your you have to pick your challenges i think you can't make the compiler do absolutely everything but um yeah. given infinite time and <laughs> yeah and resources yeah yeah so yes he's gone um i think most of the other questions we've answered um fmx yeah he, um alexander he's uh, just saying about writing a com server in fmx yeah the problem with fm fire monkey and fmx is of course that it, it is designed to be um multi-platform and so it does things in a slightly different way to a vcl app which is much more close to the metal and much more near to the operating system. So yes, there are things you can do in the VCL that you can't do in FMX. Well, people um, use people use FMX only on Windows as well because they want to, you know, they want the capabilities of doing 2D, 3D types of operations. And under the covers, of course, it's building it on top of, you know, Windows APIs, but then you don't care if you want to move it to your iPad or or your Mac or whatever, then under there it's using, you know, uh, runtime libraries, native libraries, and and sometimes OpenGL, ES, or whatever it is. Besides, yeah, we, we had a we had a little challenge a while ago for some MVPs to uh, reproduce the Windows calculator, and um, you know, make it look as much as it could like the fluent UI of the Windows calculator. And I was able to take with one Delphi program. Um, produce a VCL version that looked just like the original Windows uh, calculator as it was, and then did an FMX version, which would then work and look the same on Windows and Mac OS and Linux. And um, then I did a web TMS web core version, so it was a web app. And with that web core version, with one change to the program um, um, project, I was able to then make it turn into a Eclipse. Uh, program so it would work on any operating system that supports Eclipse and also take exactly the same web core code and make that turn into a um, progressive web app, a PWA. Uh, uh, meanwhile, in the background, the Delphi code was exactly the same. I didn't change a single line of code, 
it, it, it was reused. And, and that amount of, it was a simple, you know, task. We were just doing a calculator and you would press buttons and something would happen. But um, we could also add some components and make it use the, um, the um, you know, perspex, what do they call that? Acrylic. Use the acrylic background that you get in, in uh, Windows 10 uh, and the Fluent UI. This is the whole point about a visualization and the whole point about um, Delphi is that the code reuse, if you're very careful about how you do this with FireMonkey and, and VCL, pick your components carefully. Why not go cross-platform? Why, why not have your apps working on a Macintosh or working on a, a Linux box if there is a market there for you, if, if someone will pay you to, and why not have it as a web app as well? You know, there are differences in approach for desktop and web apps and mobile apps in particular are not the same, but, you know, really there's no excuse, I think, for, for nowadays. If you want to go on to to get, go cross-platform and you, you, you're comfortable with using FireMonkey, then it's there for you. Yeah. Okay. Like through the Q&A and it looks like I caught up on a few of them as well so yeah I think we've kind of hit everything is there anything else Mark um, you want to discuss at the moment or no thanks very much it's been very interesting uh, and all that you've shown us um, and thanks for letting me have a go at uh, showing a, a small part of our our world as well well I, I think you know speaking on but as, as a programmer I think um, I would like to say as well that you know Steamer have been there from pretty much since day one and T-Chart has always been in um, the Delphi installs. It's always been something that people have gone, let's, let's draw a chart. What chart in components should we use? T-Chart, there you go. So I think you've contributed towards making a lot of programs have um, um, charts in them that otherwise might not have done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're program. very, very yeah. happy with that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, you've been a great success. and. You know, obviously, all of the technology partners, people, you know, contribute in their own different ways. And I know some of you guys compete and things like that, but this is a big enough market for people to compete um, in a civilized manner, shall we say? <laughs> um, but you know, it, you, it, it's technology partners that help make us Delphi programmers more powerful. And so, it's it's a good relationship there. It's a win-win relationship. No, nobody loses. C plus plus builder developers. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean. Me being a Delta yeah. guy, I was um, um, slightly angled in the wrong direction. <laughs> I did put a C++ thing on the wall back there. I, I will do that. I, I'm, it's going to take me a day, probably. It may take two to update my blog, put the links to source code and thing, because for my birthday, I got this new, Ooh. new toy. Oh, that's the one that, that's got the Pi. Is that the B plus or whatever it's called built into it? It's the Pi um, 4 yeah. inside the keyboard. Yeah, I've seen this. Isn't it great? And it's it's really cost effective as well. The connectors, including the I/O pins, are on the back. Isn't that fantastic? Oh yeah. Got two, yeah, I saw I saw these. Yeah. HDMI ports, you know, plugs in the back, so you can have two screens. Anyway. Uh, and it's now, a British product, although I am an American citizen now, so I suppose I should. I'm not sure which side to play for. I'm a British American. I still have British citizenship, so I'm proud of the Raspberry Pi people. Yeah, with the memory chip, I think it cost me about 79, or maybe it was 99 with the bigger memory chip. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, you know, little uh, little card to give it a little extra memory. The Samsungy thing, yeah. Crazy, right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there's, uh, sorry, there's a question here. Um, Saying, but who is David Beneda from uh, T Chart? Yeah, and not to forget David's name, who was the who's the author of T Chart, and uh, yeah, the 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 pioneer and and really the the basis of all the code that we've been using ever since. Uh, and he's still here, um, a little bit further back from the front line, but he's he's still here and uh, with us at the moment. But yeah, the credit to T Chart and that that first version that went in way way back in. In ninety six, ninety five, ninety six was was uh, was David's code. Yeah. B e r n e d a. David Bernada. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's great to. Uh, I mean, through my role as an MVP, I get to meet quite a few of the uh, um, um, tech partners now, and uh, 
and it's nice to put faces to some of the the products and that I've I've personally used and it's made me money. You know, I've, I've a, I earn every day. I get up and I write code. That's how I earn my money. And I say that this to people that I may be an MVP, but that's because I can talk and I can write. Uh, and I'm not your typical programmer that hides away and goes, oh no, I'm not doing that. But but I, but I am a coder, and that's how I earn my living. And so I'm no different from anybody on these webinars today. I just happen to be a little bit more vocal than most. But I, coding is what makes uh, my income and pays for my bills and gets me this office I'm sitting in now. And the tech partners and, and Rad Studio are, are really how the income turns up. So it's, uh, it's a great thing. Um, any final words from you, David? No, just uh, keep on programming. Uh, programming keeps me young so if you well also depends on maybe some genetics and lifestyle choices but uh, <laughs> but you know again I I love creating things uh, every day and playing with toys I've I've got a lot of IOT devices and cameras and things and and I've got a Wi-Fi Mr. Coffee Maker so I've got my uh, you know app that sets my GPS location and uh, and uh, knows when I'm coming back to the house, uh, how long it's going to take me, Google Maps timing, and it'll start my coffee so it finishes uh, brewing right as I'm walking. <laughs> you will survive, I mean, I thought I was bad enough. We live in the dream. That's what it is. We live in the future. Uh, I'm still waiting for the flying DeLorean, but we can't have everything. <laughs> Yeah, and so it's through Wemo, and there's a, you know, rest service, and I can, you know, I can, I can do a lot of very useful human things, but I can also just explore, and that's part of what I'm doing in my semi-retirement. I did do the courses uh, in the Embarcadero Academy for C++ and Delphi on, uh, on building systems with rad server and i did the 200 page or so ebook that's available you can just go download those things and go into the academy um and uh you know working on some other little projects here and there but you know not full time i'm i'm uh, i'm trying to have fun with uh, computing as well as when i make some money it just means i can go to hawaii more often or still. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if the flights are running, that's the only thing. <laughs> we canceled last year. We've got a booking again for mid-October, if it all is okay. Um, um, a good friend of mine, Grady Booch, lives in Kanapali area of Maui, so we're going to Maui to, nice. I like the there and go out to Molokiti Crater, but uh, my underwater camera housing. But I'm hoping to meet up with uh, with Grady uh, if they'll let us into the state, they have to wait till they get 60% vaccinated. Then as long as you show your vax card, which I have, and then if they get to 70%, they just won't care anymore. You just fly in there from all over. But, uh, but I'm just wanting to make sure that everybody stays safe. Uh, my feeling, get vaccinated. I did. I got my Pfizer shots early on. Oh, great. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, you know the world will open. But the good news, you can sit here and program. Yeah. In fact, before we started, uh, Mark and I were talking, and and we're both vaccinated as well. And uh, you know, I, I mean, I I'm, I'm not going to judge anybody that chooses not to get vaccinated. But it's the secret currently for the world reopening. And certainly in Texas, where we do have a high rate of vaccination, life is returning to normal a lot more. I mean, there's some people that are against the idea, but that's the choice, but I think it, you know, overall, it would seem that science is the thing to follow rather than um, um, <laughs> superstition and, and and worry. But uh, you know, it's nice to see countries gradually that 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 that. In fact, there's a visualization for it um, from St Thomas's Hospital in the UK, which I, I don't have a link for, but you can see that that curve going down, and it's, you know, I think a lot of us have been spending an awful lot of time trapped behind. Um, doors and not being able to live a normal life, and it's nice to gradually see that easing off, you know, and and you know, coming into a more positive state of world. A lot more yeah. program that instead of uh, being out, and you know, again, um, it's a good time to learn new things, and yeah. at the same time, we protect our computers from attack. So, yeah, but enough of that. I just everyone, I miss you all. 
Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the community, but I don't miss the long immigration lines and the customs and the long flights and the waits and the delays and the weather chaos. And, I mean, I, but I do miss the, the, the hugs and well wishes uh, personally. And of course, uh, it's great to hear from everybody. It's easy, david.intersimony at gmail.com. If you want to drop me an email, just take my name, put a dot. You don't need the dot. Gmail doesn't care about the dots, but sometimes visually it's more pleasing. But uh, just david, uh, david.intersimony. And uh, and then I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook and whatever. So, uh, yeah. if you, And the blogs as well. Yeah, and back there are blogs. On the blog, if you need some help, I, you know, I can't mm -hmm. projects for people anymore. My wife, who's a retired school teacher, will uh, will get that. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I know. Yard or go down the. We have a trail that's around our property, and we watch people go by with their dogs, and we go down and around up into the mountains, so uh, to get outside. So I don't sit in front of the computer all day long. So. Yeah. yeah, I haven't quite got to that stage yet. I sit in front of the computer all day. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell from Mark's laugh, he's the same. <laughs> no, no, halfway house, I think. Yeah. I'd say we con and, and a whole bunch of other people who who helped me all along the way and uh, and gave me the opportunity to do, have all this fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I, I'm pleased to hear that as well. And I think, you know, you... you so yeah i mean you've given a lot a lot of help to people over the years and your your demonstrations are the standard I, th I think they set the standard for people who are presenting i think they set the standard for people that carry out webinars and things like that you got a very laconic style a very approachable style and uh, and you look like a programmer i mean I don't, <laughs> I don't think anybody else would look more like a programmer than you i, I don't mean, know Cantu's uh, dark at delphi you know uh, Mark Miller doing live coding on Twitch. Yeah. I mean, there's some really excellent people out there. Well, I saw I, you, I saw you interviewing um, Bjarne Strustrop as well, which is he remarkable guy, very uh, slightly odd, but uh, <laughs> but um, you know he's very intelligent. It's a guilty pleasure that I've had that I could also spend time with all these other people, uh, you know that that made all the travel and all the work that we did. Um, let me have some of that. I mean, meeting Matsumoto San, the author of Ruby in Tokyo, that was very cool. Wow. And, and there's still some I haven't met. Of course, growing up part of the time with Anders Halsberg, you know, when he was a younger kid in Denmark, 17 year old, and then when he moved to Santa Cruz Aptos and lived near. And so it was great to have him around every day. And then when he went to Microsoft, boy, I, I, I think he was afraid to say goodbye because he thought I would hit him because we had this intense rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> of course, my brother separated at birth, uh, Charlie Calvert, who worked with me and traveled with me and uh, wrote lots of books on Delphi. I, I gave him temporarily up for a while because we needed more documentation and programmer's guide for the first Delphi and when they asked could Charlie help I said yeah absolutely I mean yeah just keeping Charlie happy was a very important thing as well as uh you know getting good documentation and samples in the first version and I think, I think that was really one of the biggest things that helped with the adoption of the language was that it wasn't just Pascal it was a well-documented visual development uh, um system that had good explanations you could hit f1 and it told you exactly what to do yeah. uh, and, that, and that is a trend that has gone away now you know uh, as a technical author myself mm. you know it, it's very difficult to be told no write less write less oh you only need to use this xml documentation and stuff like this oh, i think this is an absolute see i'm going to rant now <laughs> but i think it's a big big mistake they say people don't read it people don't read it well, if I hadn't read it, I would not be a Delphi programmer to this day. You know, well, it, the documentation, you know, Wiki that's now there and and Quality Central, so you can easily report things versus having to call on the phone or get on the bulletin board system by software by Mustang Software way back then. 
I mean, that the whole community helping everyone, MVP helping, Jim orchestrating all of this. Um, again, but it's really everyone out there, you, you are the ones that keep uh, Delphi and C++ Builder moving forward. The, the component wow. developers, the authors, the consultants, the trainers, you know, maybe Marco Cantu, when he became an employee, it was like, we get to have Marco Cantu be part of it? <laughs> yeah, I get on very well with Marco. <laughs> He's a great guy. <laughs> Jim, sorry you got dropped off somehow, but uh, keep well, going. He He's will... around. He's just not on, <laughs> on the <Yeah>. system. <laughs> we'll, uh, we will keep helping him help everybody be successful as much as we can. So that's enough, I think, for me. Okay. One here in uh, Ashland. So. Well, thanks a lot, David. Uh, you know, I appreciate it. And Mark, um, yeah. if you want to have, if you got any final goodbyes or? Well, no, th thanks again to you both. I enjoyed it very much. Very interesting. Uh, and, and listening to David is very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, T Coffee & Code is uh, the intention with the T Coffee & Code series. And there are some plans to do some more things, maybe slightly shorter um, coming up, but <clears throat> We're having a meeting about that later, but uh, um, you know, it's it's the the idea is to be less scripted, less of a look at my presentation. Here we go. But I think there's also room to have a presentation and then evolve that into more of a discussion. And I think it's been very great to hear from both of you. You know, uh, uh, and and you know, it's it's been a lot of fun. Well, um, thanks very much to everybody that's put in their questions. Um, there will be a replay and there will be handouts and we will make sure you get them. Um, Jim has not uh, disappeared or beamed up by aliens. He is around. He's just got a terrible internet connection. And there's a lot going on with his work and things like that as well. Um, and everybody says, we miss David. I come back. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to retire. And uh, a lot of people saying thanks very much to Mark as well. Um, thanks, everybody. And okay. uh, we'll Thank see you. Bye-bye. Okay. Cheers then. Bye now. Bye-bye.